And I'll actually be reading from the New King James Version uh, for your hearing. And it reads this way. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. For you, O oh God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O oh, prepare mercy and truth, which may preserve him. So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. The word of God for the people of God. God. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, allow, O God, that I may shrink before your people, that you may rise up in me with a new understanding of a word for, your, for those who may listen and see. And God, soften my voice, that your voice may be louder from the heavens, that they may hear your redeeming call upon their hearts and their souls. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. I'd like to preach from the subject, Sweet Hour of Prayer. As you all know, we are in the, the midst of a sermon series on some of the great hymns of the church. And so sweet hour of prayer is the one in which we will look at today. But before we actually get into this, 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 this hymn and look at where it, get its, it gets its uh, history, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the author. Sweet hour of prayer was actually recorded for the first time in the New York Observer in 1845. And the author, William Wolford, was actually a blind preacher of England. Literally, he could not see. Yet he is described as a man of obscure birth and connections and no education, but of strong mind and most retentive memory. In the pulpit, he never failed to select a lesson well adapted to his subject, giving chapter and verse with unerring precision, and scarcely ever misplacing a word in his repetition of the Psalms. Every part of the New Testament, the prophecies, and some of the histories, so as you have the reputation, repetition, he knew the entire Bible by heart. Blind man knew the entire Bible by heart. Each time he would select his text for which he would preach with clarity, with precision. And so William, to me, is a man of whom I can admire. And I admire him for these various reasons of which I want to share with you a chain of thought. As we've come to know, a prayer is nothing more in its simplest terms but a conversation with God, a conversation with the Almighty, one who is attentive to what we are saying and how we are saying it. And we also know that the Bible is the inspired word of God. There are those who had heard from God, prophets and others who actually heard God speak and then they transformed God's word onto paper. And thus persons who have memorized the Bible are indeed those who I feel have the essence of God's word in them. And they articulate it in a, in a way that gives them strength in the way they speak. And to actually quote verse and chapter each time you speak is profound. And so to memorize all of that is to say that William had a fond and intimate relationship with God, wouldn't you say? To actually know the entire Bible by heart. In order to do that, you have to literally be connected to the Almighty in a way that I can vastly possibly imagine. And so it is my understanding that each time he 
prepared a message. Each time he, that he looked at the words in the text, each time he had to say for himself, what do these words actually mean? Each word had to have a meaning for him in order for him to put it in a context that others who heard it could be changed. And so I want to share with you an experience that I had on this week. This week, uh, for two and a half days, I participated in a workshop entitled Undoing Racism. Undoing Racism. And one thing became evidently clear because a question was asked by everyone in the room, what is racism? And each of us gave a visceral response to how it looked. But none of us could actually define what it was. And so it made it very clear to me that in our walk, we truly need to understand what words mean. Because just like that chair, a chair is a chair. No matter how you use it, it's still a chair. So each word has a meaning. And when those words have meaning and they're put together in the context of a sentence, that sentence has a meaning. And each time that sentence is brought together in the form of scripture, that scripture has a context. And that context then forms how we understand what God is saying to us, which is why each word has meaning. But we've, what we've also learned, at least in our Bible studies, is this, is sometimes you can't take everything literally, amen? Uh, when, when they said that Methuselah lived 900 and some odd years, uh, I'm struggling with that. But I can say this, Methuselah lived a long time. And that's all that really matters, right? That you know that this person lived a long time. And let's be honest, if Methuselah did live that long, the only person that could verify his age is who? Him. Right? They're the only ones that actually could verify his age. It's him. Anyway, I want us to now look at this text in the context in which it was written that we might understand what William was thinking about when he used it to put together this hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. In verse 1 of Psalm 61, it says, Hear my cry, O God attend to my prayer, my prayer. Can you imagine saying to God, I need you to listen just to me. With all of you in this room, I need you to listen just to me. That's a pretty bold statement, don't you think? With everything that God's got on his, God's plate, we're going to say, God, I need you to listen just to me. And sometimes what we have to say, God ain't trying to hear. Amen? Oh, Y'all not hearing me this morning. I'm sure you've asked God for things, and God goes, oh, you want what? <laughs> but God listens anyway. God listens to everything that we say, each and every last one of it, every last syllable. He knows the intent by which we even said it each and every last one of us. And that's what a prayer is. It's a conversation with God, but here's the part that I think we challenge, that we are challenged with the most. In order to have a conversation, you have to both listen and do what? Respond, right? You have to, you have to speak and respond, right? And that's usually how it works. So how many of us are praying and then listening for the response? Anybody? Amen. Some of y'all did this. <laughs> it's a two-way street when you're having a conversation. This constant acts, ask, ask, ask all the time and not ever listening for what God has to say about your situation, that's not a conversation. God's asking us each time when we ask God to attend to our prayers, God is also saying to us, you need to listen to what I'm telling you. If I tell you to let it go, let it go. If I tell you to trust me, trust me. If I tell you to forgive, forgive. And every time I've said this, 
The Bible makes it very clear when God is speaking, he puts it in his word. And how many times has God told us each and every time to do those things? But yet each time we pick it up and try to fix it ourselves, don't we? Don't we? We come to this all to God, you know what? Mm. I need you to uh, uh, take care of this, this, this sickness that's in my body. And weeks go by, months go by, and the sickness isn't gone. And you decide, well, you know what? I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Did God tell you to do this? Did God tell you to do that? How many times, and I said this in, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, how many times have we looked at our calendar? And we've said that, God, you know, I got all this stuff to do, and, you know, it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's just too much for me. And, and then God says, well, did I tell you to do that? Or did you tell you to do that? There's also a listening that goes along with this conversation with God. And then in verse 2, it says, from the ends of the earth, I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. How many times have we thought that what we have to share with God is too petty to give to God? I'm giving you the opposite. Oh, we, we're good at giving God our deepest burdens, but I want to give you the opposite to that. Did you ask God for direction in how you would behave today? that you would try to be Christ-like? Did you ask God that you would get to church safely? Did you ask God that uh, uh, your breakfast that would, be, would be warm and that your cereal would be cold? Did you ask God that uh, you would, you, he would just give you traveling mercy just from this place to that, to that door? Are you in constant conversation with God? Because Paul made it very clear that we ought to pray without what? Ceasing. So in all that we do, we ought to be laying ourselves before God in conversation. And then the text goes on and says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. How many times have we thought that we had all the answers? Anybody? Tell the truth, shame the devil. We thought we had all the answers. Didn't need God for nothing. But there's a rock much higher than us. It's the mountain by which David talks about in this context where he says, that is the place where I find my shelter in you, O God. A strong tower in times when I am faced with my enemy. David was actually on the run from Saul when this text was written. Saul was in deep pursuit of him for four years because he did not want David to reign as king. He thought that that was his birthright. He wanted his children to follow him. So David had to hide. And God gave him a place to be. How many times have you needed to be just in a place where you can hold up for a little while? Hmm? Hold up from all of the drama that's going on in life. Just hold up just for a little while to feel safe from all of the, the dangers and, and the toils that are going on in the world. So that you can say the same way that David says, I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I was talking to a young lady the other day about, uh, it was very clear that she understood that Jesus was her savior. She understood that Jesus died for her sins. She understood that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice that she might inherit eternal life. But then I asked her, but do you know Jesus as Lord? Jesus as Lord means that you will follow Jesus, that you will be a, you will be a learner of what Jesus does. Saying Jesus is your Lord also says that when Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do, you will do the same. Even after they beat him within an inch of his life, on an old rugged cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. When we ask to actually truly Abide in the vows that David is talking about in verse 5. He says, for you, O God, I have heard my vows. A promise that we made to God. That when we receive God into our hearts and that we say that God was not only our Savior and Lord, that we would do what the Lord commanded of us. All that God commanded of us. We don't get to pick and choose on the commandments. We don't get to pick and choose uh, it says, love thy neighbor as, my, as thyself. You know what? I'm not feeling my neighbor right now. 
uh, Lord, I don't, I don't know about this love thing. Um, you, it's a commandment. It's, it's not a choice. Now, I will help you out, and I, and I love the way uh, Dr. King put this. Uh, God, I, I appreciate the fact that you told me to love people, but I don't have to like them. Amen? I don't have to like them. There is a difference. You do know, does anyone know the difference between love and like? Amen. We got a few witnesses out there. Uh, Dr. King said, you know what, uh, Lord, uh, uh, you can't commanded me to love them, which means that in, 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 in the direst of situations, if, if they were hurting, I would do my best to help them. But when it comes to uh, 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 me inviting them over to dinner, <laughs> I don't know about that one. Me, me taking them out for a happy meal, I, I don't know. I, but God, if you command me, hello, watch this, there, there's a button there. But God, if you command me, I will do it. I'm thankful God hasn't asked me to do that yet, but God is good. The Bible also says, and he makes it very clear, as Paul is speaking, he says, you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. We wrestle with this in Bible study all the time about this concept of fear. But you know, a little fear goes a long way. Um, I've shared this story before, and I like sharing it, so I'm going to share it again. Um, and my father's here, so and I know if he's heard it at least a few times. Um, uh, my mother and I uh, uh, were in a grocery store. Some of y'all know it already. And uh, we're walking down the aisle, and, and, my, and I'm, I'm, I'm pulling stuff off the shelf. And uh, my, my mother says, uh, you need to stop doing that. And, uh, and she puts the stuff back on the shelf. And then we go a little bit further, and I pull something else off the shelf. She says, look, this is your last warning. So we turn the aisle, and uh, we're going up the thing, and I, I pull something else off the shelf. Next thing I know, I'm, I'm getting up off the ground, and my, my mother's turning the next corner. From that point on, she had no problem with me pulling stuff off the shelf. That was fear. <laughs> that, that was genuine fear. That's right, genuine fear. But over time, guess what that turned into? Respect. Turning respect. And turning to understanding that, you know, sometimes, not, no, not sometimes, but all the times, we need to be reverent with God. We need to trust God. We need to abide in God. We need to allow God to move and have its being in us. In order to do that, sometimes we need to truly fear God in the circumstances of our actions. Because let's be honest, if you do something outside of the ark of God's love to someone else, you could truly damage them for life. That old phrase that we grew up with that uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me is a total lie because words can transform a life forever. David then goes on and says, you will prolong, prolong the king's life where the, the writers tend to think that maybe this was not David speaking but someone else because then David will be speaking in the third person. But that in order to have this relationship with God, we need to understand that the king, the one that is governing over us needs to be of a sound mind. The one who is leading us needs to have a relationship to the one who is giving that person joy. And so we do need to pray for our leaders, those who have command over us. We need to pray for those leaders because if they are out of sorts, it makes it worse for everyone. Wouldn't you agree? Uh, how many of y'all know about the 1%? Anybody know about the 1%? When I say the 1%, anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody? Just one hand? Okay. Well, did you all know, and, and this is fact, that 1% of the world's population makes a decision for the other 99%? Oh, now you, okay, now you know. <laughs> The, the, the money holders, the, that 1%, that top 1% are making the decision for all the 99%. Do, 
don't you think we need to be praying for them? Don't you think we need to be praying for their souls? We need to be praying for their guidance. We need to be praying for their deliverance. We need to be praying for them because God, if they continue on this track of greed and selfishness, it just makes it worse for everybody. But as a church, we have a responsibility. And this is where it gets interesting. It says here in verse 7, He shall abide before God forever, that being the king. But oh, prepare mercy and truth, which we must preserve. So I will sing praise to your name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. What are your vows to God? What are your vows to God? Do you promise to pray to God in all seasons? Do you promise to to love your neighbor as yourself? Do you promise to give the best that you have in order that others might see the light in you, that Christ may be lifted up? Are you fulfilling the vow that you made to this United Methodist Church? to give up your time, talents, and treasures in order that we might build up the kingdom here on earth. And notice I said time, talents, I didn't say or, and treasures. These are the gifts that God has given to us that we might continue to build this corner of Zion that others' lives might be changed. Because let's be honest, as much as so many people think we don't need the church, (laughs) without it, where would we be? Where would we be? So it is my prayer that as we continue to study the words of the scripture, the words placed in sentences that are placed in context, that we might indeed learn God's word, that we might strengthen our relationship to God, that we might truly absorb the vows that we've made to the Almighty, that we will do our best to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself. And if you are having trouble loving yourself, let me give you another commandment, one that comes from Jesus himself. He says, love others as I have loved you. Has Jesus been good to you? Has Jesus been good to you? Has he been there through thick and thin? Has he stood in the gap when you needed him the most? Is he truly the author and finisher of your faith? Is he the one that you can look to for an example of how you are to live your life? I'm going to leave you with this. You are my friend.